There's been a huge shift in the way that people think about the natural world. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's an odd thing that uh, over the last 50, 60 years of when television has been going, uh, human beings have become, I mean, to start with, the population has tripled, but also they tend to live in towns and become more and more cut off from the natural world in the way that my grandfather or great-grandfather would know all the things about the British countryside. Uh, I don't. Uh, on the other hand, um, television has enabled people to see aspects of the world that my great-grandfather didn't even know exist. I've had a, a privileged time, I mean, to be able to just think of something in the abstract and say, that must be very interesting to see it, and play your cards right, you go and see it. As dusk gives way to twilight, the encroaching darkness is lit by life. These dancing lights around me are produced by fireflies, creatures that have the strange ability to produce light. They bioluminesce. Bioluminescence is one of the most extraordinary things uh, uh, you could ever see in the natural world, in my view. Um, we have very little experience of it in this country. There are glowworms, that is true. But compared with the shows that you can see in parts of the tropic seas, or indeed in the woodlands of, uh, of North America, where there are something like a dozen different species of fireflies, all flashing different time signals to, to, to sort themselves out and find the right mates. Um, and it is a, a, a breathtaking spectacle when you see it. And the cameras that were developed, latest cameras about a year ago, were f over 4,000 times more sensitive than the early cameras of, say, 50 years ago. So suddenly you're able to take uh, shots of, of creatures flashing, which you could never do before. They're so perfectly visible and plain to, to human eye, but we didn't have cameras that could record it. Now we have. Um, and so we are, the program is showing a this huge variety of different um, organisms that, which use light. In the early 1950s, uh, all television was live, effectively. Um, and the only animal programs we did uh, were with animals from the London Zoo that were brought in up to Alexander Palace in the middle of the night and put on a, a doormat on the table. Um, and um, uh, someone who, who knew about animals explained what they were and why they were the way they were. And for me, as a one-time scientist, this was very unsatisfactory. It made the animals look like freaks. And I cooked up an idea with a friend of mine who was curator of reptiles in the London Zoo, that we could go uh, with them to see how these animals were caught in the wild. And we would film them being caught. And then for the close-ups and so on, we would get these live studio sequences. Um, and that was the origin of Zoo Quest. A few months ago, a remarkable discovery was made in the vaults of the BBC Natural History Unit. An archivist was checking through some of the film cans from ZooQuest. She took a closer look at these reels of film and realised that she had unearthed a piece of television history. They were some of the original films shot on location, over six hours' worth. Not only were they in extremely good condition, but they were actually in colour. I think um, young people or middle-aged people who come to that uh, often say, oh, what's it like to look like when you uh, are those early periods? And the, the sad truth is that actually that's what I think I look like. And when I get up in the morning and I see that my hair is grey and my face is haggard and one thing or another, I don't say, oh, that's what you look like now. I say, oh, it's just a bad morning. You know, you really look like that young boy who was running around bare to the waist and wrestling with pythons. Um, <laughs> that's how I, <laughs> I suppose I've got to come to face to face with reality sometime. But at the moment, I look, I'm not surprised. My children, I may say, um, and my grandchildren are astounded, but um, I'm not. We loaded all our equipment into the hold beneath the tiny cabin. That was the tape recorder. Our kit.
and the camera. We didn't take much food because we expected to be able to catch enough fish to last us for the few days it was going to take us to get to Komodo. And at last, we're off.